And so people are not necessarily concerned altogether about what we say, right? There's a constant scrutiny, scrutinize in what you are, your character. I saw your upon the You are with me there in First John. We're going to get ready and uh, read a passage of Scripture, first, first chapter entirely. Let's read responsibly. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon in our hands, have handled the word of life. For the life was manifested. And we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we've seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. Truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If, if we, we say, say that, that we have, have not sinned, sinned we, we make, make him, him a liar, liar and, and his, his word, word is, is not, not in, in us. us. All right, now let us read them. Sorry, two more verses here, I think, to complete that thought. Verse 1 in chapter 2, somebody. My little children... These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Together. And, and he, he is, is the propitiation the for our sins, sins and, and not for ours sin, only, but also for the, the sins of the, of the whole, whole world. world. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for the word of God and asking now for the clarity of a precious word. Lord, we know that you're here. Your presence is here. Such a wonderful, warm way. Oh, God, take control and minister to our hearts individually and collectively. We're all here to hear your mind, your word, your voice, your wisdom, your understanding, and your knowledge. Keep us in your grace and your peace. And Lord, let healing take place. Let deliverance take place. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are dependent upon you today. Do it for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. And now we take authority over, every, uh, over the atmosphere completely. And Lord, we bind back every hindering power. By the authority of Jesus' name, we forbid it and we cancel its assignment. In the name of Jesus Christ of God, we break its power and we shut it down. We forbid it now by the authority of Jesus' name and command it to cease and go. For it's in Jesus' name, God, we pray. And everyone said, 
Amen. Come on, give him a praise again. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory. Glory. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. I want to thank the Lord for his mercy toward all of us. He's been good, and I pray that, you know, the older I get, the more I pray that God's word find course in our life, that we would be recipients and participants, recipients of God's love, his grace, his power, and participants in fellowship with him and with one another. And John here, this aged disciple, it is believed that this epistle was written uh, toward the turn of the, the uh, second century, somewhere in uh, 90 AD, after John was up there in the age, and um, his best and most ripest insight and information was given. And so it's very simple but so profound what he's saying. You know, you get the best of a person's life after they have come to maturity. And all of the old motives have been purified, right? You can hear them more clearly. John had come to this point according to studies to a ripe old age. And uh, even in his young age and years, he loved Jesus. And uh, he was that beloved disciple that was there that lay on Jesus' breast. And uh, he's the disciple whom the Bible points out. The disciple whom Jesus loved. And it is said when people think about John, they think about him as the apostle of love. And he's a great, he was a uh, wonderful man of God and apostle. But we look in the first chapter here, John, there are five chapters in this pistol here it is said and believe and scholars really don't differ pretty much it's unanimous that in the claim that John the apostle wrote this epistle and second and third John along with Revelation and Saint John and so he um, was consistent in his claim of uh, the things that he said about Jesus so we look at the first verse in the second, that which was from the beginning which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Then in parenthesis, parenthesis, he gets a little bit more detail for the life was manifested and we've seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we've seen and heard declare we to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. I want to take for a thought, keeping it real, Keeping it real. You, you, you've heard that. Quite often I was listening to a game show with um, Harvey. <laughs> Steve Harvey. And uh, one of the participants there said, I'm just keeping it real. And you, among each other we hear that keeping it honest, genuine, you know, being true to oneself, right? Keeping it real. We're living in a day and time when there's a cry to keep it real, right? We see it in the White House, we see it in politics where people are afraid to keep it real. Are they will not dare to be true to themselves. For some reason they are afraid. And yet truth needs to be said, right? 
is so important because uh, there are few that uh, are respected for their integrity, right? And uh, I, I believe as Christians, we must, we must walk in int integrity. That's big with God. And so look at somebody and say, let's keep it real. One of the general thoughts about this holy epistle is dealing with fellowship with other Christians. And um, John, as we said, was um, the beloved disciple. And here John said he was an eyewitness. Follow with me now if you, as we think about it. Here's somebody that's an eyewitness. He has a greater assurance and what he's about to say than someone that has second or third hand information, right? They cannot say, I know for a fact or I have seen it for myself, but they may, like Jesus said about Thomas, you're still blessed because you haven't seen it, but you believe. But here's one here among the 11 that was an eyewitness and to be an eyewitness having a first hand account carries a lot of weight and certainty and assurance when the person is trying to uh, persuade or influence others and as we said John was that disciple that was close to his master and for some way the scripture points out Jesus loved him and the tradition says that John was banished on the Isle of Patmos and while the other were others were martyred believed that he was on the Isle of Patmos and he on one occasion was thrown into a big pot of boiling hot grease and he didn't die But obviously God had some concluding things to show him. And on the Isle of Patmos there he got revelations from God caught up into heaven and God began to show him as the scripture says what must surely, certainly, slow, uh, shortly come to pass. So the, the apostles were living, they just felt so sure that before, they, before their lifetime was over God was coming back. But they live. It's a good way to live, really. Uh, so uh, you be prepared. But uh, so he was an eyewitness, and listen to what he said. Um, um, the first few verses is dealing with the reality of the incarnation. God manifested in the flesh. And um, the word manifested in the flesh. So he says concerning the word of life, that which we've seen and heard, which we've looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. And he also says that which was from the beginning he talks about it in St. John. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. This Word of life, this eternal life was literally manifested in a way so that John and the others could see and understand beyond doubt that this was God manifested in the flesh. So he has such an assurance. And I was reading this here, um, what he had to say concerning the Son of God and he being eyewitnesses, an eyewitness of God's, uh, of Jesus Christ. He said that which, let me go back, verse 1, that 
which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon in our hands, have handled of the word of life. And looked upon the commentary was saying it means it describes an intense scrutiny an inspection if you will it was not an optical illusion it was careful observance even though he claimed to be the son of God living and operating with him and dealing with him seeing him operate so there was a close scrutiny there was literally an inspection of what he was witnessing and seeing anybody hear what I'm saying so that he's speaking conclusively now as a result of this close scrutiny this close uh, inspection of who claimed to be the son of God so his conclusion was he of a truth was God manifested in the flesh and that which we've looked upon which we've beheld beheld denotes calm continuous contemplation of an object which remains before the spectator Gaze and just have you ever had someone uh, uh, and I've had this to happen I'm sure some of you have um, people are not saying anything you may be talking in a company of people and someone you find they're just 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 contemplating listening to you they're, they're seeing beyond the surface something about you they're just and so they, they don't have any words but they're in, inspecting you what you claim to be right did you know people do that to you and so people are not necessarily concerned altogether about what we say right there's a constant scrutiny scrutinize in what you are your character the way you handle yourself the things that you say your life under pressure constantly observing and once a person is satisfied after close inspection that you are who you say you are then they want to follow you and so this is where it was with John the disciples Jesus it wasn't just enough to say uh, uh, to walk with him and tell him I'm the one that uh, Israel longed for. So he examined him. And the word beheld, of course. And then he said, our hands have handled, handle indicates an actual handling with the intent of learning the composition of something. So there was, and when you put it all together, you see him coming to the conclusion you know, this, this was God. Many instances in the life of John and Jesus operating, you know, he had to, he brought this to, he came to this conclusion. And one of those instances was when they were on the boat and it looked like the, the ship was about to sink. And there they were on the boat fearing for their lives. And then all of a sudden Jesus comes. Walking on the sea. And if though that was not enough to convince them. He went beyond that. He said be not afraid it's I. And Peter said well Lord if it's you. Uh, bid me to walk on the water. Jesus said come. Got out of his boat and began to walk on the water. It's human. The other instance was when. He stopped, he got into the boat, and the boat was instantly at the shore. 
Bible doesn't claim how it happened, but as soon as he got there, instantly the Bible said the, bo the boat was on the shore. The other instance when they were out there to see Jesus was sleeping in the back. Now, I know John had to be thinking and concluding with all of his scrutiny, right? There he was sleeping in the back when they were scared to death. Woke him up, Master, Master, get up, we're about to be destroyed. He get up and he said, why are y'all so fearful? And he looked at the sea and he said, peace, be still. Such a great calm. Dead lives, people that were dead, raised to life again. John saw this with his own eyes. Crippled people begin to walk. Withered hands. It was undeniable that this had to be God the Son. And after his old age and seeing and then began to see things take place in his own life and God to to duplicate or manifest the power of God and seeing that John in his old age is writing now and there was heresies, there was this Gnostic heresy that had infiltrated the churches and but he was quite able to speak to the people and there were this group of believers here that some were still a little confused. They didn't know if the Gnostics were telling the truth and they were somewhat deluded. They just needed some reassurance. Hello. And uh, so John, knowing the power of this deception and corruption, was concerned about the churches. It is believed in his latter years he was in Ephesus. In a lot of the churches in Ephesus, he oversaw. But so I just kind of wanted to paint a brief picture here concerning John and the certainty uh, that he felt and understood about Christ. And um, so he says, verse four now is is the first of three part purpose. First is found in verse four, and these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. The second one is found in chapter 2 verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not, and if any man sin we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he's the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And the last one is found in chapter 5, last of the threefold, three-part purpose. Verse 13, these things have I written to you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. It's threefold purpose. The first part found in verse 4 in chapter 1, that your joy may be full. There's something about joy um, is it is a quality of the spirit and it's not to be mistaken for what we may call happiness. Happiness is more of a variable or emotion. Happiness can come and go, right? So when we're saying rejoice in the Lord, we're not saying just be happy. If I, if a, a person gives you a check for a thousand dollars, you can be happy, right? Especially if you have a financial need, right? That's emotion. And so... But if you go to the bank and the bank says, no, that account's closed. There's no money in the account. That happiness turns into sadness. Isn't that right? So happiness is not what he's saying here in that sense. He's talking about a fruit or quality of the spirit. Are you with me? 
once that is produced, it, a person can't take that away from you. Because it's not produced by a person, right? It's produced by God. And so that's what he's talking about. He said, uh, that which we've seen and heard declare we to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So, um, having fellowship with one another is predicated upon our fellowship with God. If we have good, true fellowship with God, we're going to have good fellowship among one another. Are you with me? If I cannot fellowship with you and I'm supposed to be spiritual and we are brothers and sisters it means there's something wrong with my fellowship with him. Are you with me? Because I cannot love God whom I've never seen if I cannot love you who I see every day. So John wanted to, against the Gnostics, straighten out these things so that the believers would not have that trouble in mind and understand and have, first of all, that fulfillment of joy. Jesus had something to say about joy, so I'm going to read a little right fast. And whom, having not seen you, you love, but I'm sorry, whom having not seen ye love, and whom, though now you see him not, ye believing yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. So joy is a quality of the spirit. So I can have joy. And things can be going on around my life. According to the word of God. Is that right? So when God tells us to rejoice. We're rejoicing in him. I saw your care. Upon the Lord. Cast all your care. Father 